Praise the Lord, saints. Pastor Daryl Scott here once again. As I say each and every week, Senior Pastor, New Spirit Revival Center Church in Cleveland Heights, Ohio, along with my lovely wife, co-pastor, best half, Dr. Belinda Scott. Hey, listen, we're in the midst of Holy Week right now, the holiest week on the Christian calendar. It began on this past Sunday uh, as we observed Palm Sunday, the day of Jesus Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem in fulfillment of prophecy, um, in fulfillment of messianic expectations. Um, Zechariah prophesied it. There's a reference to it in the Psalms when the people shouted, Hosanna. Just a, just a glorious day. Amen. That uh, we celebrated, we observed, we commemorated on this past Sunday, and it proceeds up into this Holy Week now. Um, um, well, just let me say this to clear up any misunderstanding people might have. Jesus was actually crucified on a Wednesday. He was crucified on a Wednesday, the day of preparation before the Passover. Amen. He was the ultimate final Passover lamb slain from the foundation of the world for the remission of man's sins and the redemption of mankind back from the hands of the devil. He was crucified on a Wednesday. He was put in the grave Wednesday evening. Uh, and he was there Wednesday evening, Thursday evening, Friday evening, which was three full nights. He was in the grave Thursday morning, Friday morning, Saturday morning, three full days. He rose up Saturday evening, Sabbath evening. He was already gone, already resurrected from the tomb when the women arrived there at daybreak. Amen. And so we're going to go into a word on today, examining some of the um, aspects, the intricacies, the dynamics, the nuances of Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead, which is what we commem commemorate on what we call Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Amen. To be quite honest, if we're saved, every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Every day is a resurrection day. He has caused us, amen, we have been raised up together with him, and we're seated together with him high in the heavenly places. Amen. We walk in the newness of life because of what Jesus Christ accomplished on Calvary on our behalf. And so we observe the resurrection. Amen. It's a momentous event, a one-of-a-kind event, something that never happened before, something that will never happen again. You know, uh, Jesus dismissed his spirit. He gave up the ghost. He voluntarily surrendered his life on our behalf. So we're going to go into this word on this evening. If you have an ear to hear and a heart to receive, I guarantee it can be a blessing to you. Amen. And then we'll be back afterwards to chop it up and talk about a few other things after it's over. All right. See you in a little bit. And I pray you come back. Let's begin with the third verse. Then we're going to go for one verse. No, then you meet me in Hebrews. I'm going to stop in 2 Corinthians for one verse. And then meet me in Hebrews, the second chapter. Once we read Psalm 8, go over to the second chapter of the book of Hebrews. Let's read. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visited him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the work of thine hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beast of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. O Lord, O Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Turn to the second chapter of the book of Hebrews. While I pop over in uh, 2 Corinthians and read one verse of Scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning with the third verse. Are you there? Let's read. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. For unto the angels has he not put in subjection the world to come, where we speak but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. 
Thou crownest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Let's pray. Father, in the outstanding, tremendous, magnificent, spectacular, amazing name of Jesus, whose we are and whom we serve, we thank you once again, amen, for allowing us access into your holy presence to worship you in spirit and truth and in the liberty that our great country provides on this day that we commemorate and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from the dead. Now bless us through the entrance and the light and the enlightenment that accompanies the reception of your holy word. And we give you glory, honor, and praise in advance for the blessings we anticipate and expect to receive. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm going to go short today, about three and a half, four hours. <laughs> and then we'll be all right. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, presents to its readers the fact that Jesus was made sin with our sinfulness so that we might be made righteous with his righteousness. Again, it states where he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, even though he actually was our sin offering. He became an offering for our sins. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, where it says he has made him to be sin, the word is raw, which means sin offering. He did not literally become sin itself. That's an impossibility. I mean, sin is a beneficial act of, against God, and he didn't do that. Amen. He was a lamb without spot or blemish. Now, the entire Bible in both the Old and the New Testament emphasizes, saints, that the final outcome, the ultimate result of sin is death. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4 declares the soul that sinneth shall die and that verse is written in the present continuous tense literally meaning that the soul that habitually and continually practices sin shall die shall be cut off and separated from God James 1 and 15 says that sin when it is finished when it comes to completion brings forth death so we have to understand saints that the death that Jesus died was the inevitable outcome of human sin which he had taken upon himself in that he made himself accountable or responsible for all of the sins of mankind. Amen. He bore the sin of all men and consequently he died the death that was and is due to all men. He bore the sin and the penalty for sin in our place. Amen. Now, can I take my time, lay a foundation, and then we'll, amen. In referencing the passages of Scripture that we read, saints of God, would serve as our foundation on this morning. Uh, if we only read those passages of Scripture superficially, we would easily conclude that these are not, uh, that they are somewhat difficult to grasp the meaning of. But when we do grasp the meaning, we'll see that their meaning is very, very, you know, excellent. It's tremendous. The writer of Hebrews, Paul the Apostle, begins these verses with a quote from Psalm 8, verses 3 through 6. Amen. Psalm 8 itself is a psalm which sings of the glory that God gave to man. Amen. And it speaks of the glory of man 
man as God meant man to be. Psalm 8 is an expansion of the promise that God made to man in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 when he instructed man to exercise dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowls of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the face of the earth. Amen. Psalm 8 extends that dominion, saints of God, to include all of the works of God's hands up to and including the moon and the stars. Amen. And so the glory of man, according to God's original tent, is even greater than the King James Version implies because in its most literal sense, amen, it is translated not that man is made a little lower than the angels. Uh, in the original Hebrew, it states that man was made a little lower than Elohim. And Elohim is the regular Hebrew word that is given throughout the Old Testament for God. In other words, man was made a little lower than God. Man is the next best thing to God on this earth. Uh, look at that person next to you and say, guess what? You're the next best thing to God. Amen. Uh, man is the next best thing to God on this earth. Man was originally crowned. The Bible says he was crowned with glory and honor. That word crown is the Hebrew word atzai, which literally means surrounded or enveloped or encased. Man was originally enveloped and encased in the Shekinah glory of God. Amen. But when man fell, man lost that glory. When man fell, amen, sin caused the glory that was encasing and enveloping man to dissipate. So that when man, after the dissipation of God's glory, saw that he was naked, the Bible says he was ashamed and sought to cover himself. So then Psalm 8 articulates the idea, saints, that man who was made once again a shade lower than God, and higher than angels that when God intended to, uh, man to have dominion over the universe he intended man to have dominion over creation under God he did, intended for man to be in authority under authority Hebrews states amen, that man's actual condition is very different from God's original intent amen that yes God man was meant to have dominion over everything but man does not have dominion over everything and how many of you can testify this morning how many of you can be truthful enough to acknowledge that the things that you know that you are supposed to dominate oftentimes exercise dominion over you that you are very oftentimes conquered by that which you should conquer or should have already conquered. We're supposed to have dominion over the earth. But some of us are under the dominion of the things of the earth. Some of us are under the control of the grapes. Or we're under the control of the leaf. Or we're under the control of the hops and grains or the poppy flowers. Come on, you know you're supposed to be better. You know you're supposed to have better. Amen. Man right now is a creature who is on the whole frustrated by his circumstances defeated by his temptations wrapped about by his own weakness confused by his inabilities just look at man today uh, and tell me what you see all you see is frustration and instability all you see is insecurity and uncertainty all you see is worry and stress and strain and fear the bible says why do the heathen rage and the the wicked imagine the vain thing. Man knows that man needs a change in society, but man does not know how to affect that change in and of itself. He doesn't know how to accomplish it and does not have the power to change, even if he did know how. Touch somebody and say, I know that's right. Here's man created by God to be great, created by God to do great, but man is not great. Those who should should be free are bound those who should be kings are slave one thing we know for sure saints one thing that mankind is in almost universal agreement on is the fact that man is not what man was meant to be by God Give me a little bit more on the high end. and I'm, I'm a little unbalanced. I'm, I'm more out there than I am up here. <laughs> because of sin, man has fallen short of the glory that God intended for us to have. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of sin, man has become, amen, depraved. And man has become uncivilized in his behavior. Because of sin, violence and sickness and filth have become normal and peace 
and health and cleanliness has become abnormal. Can I preach this morning like God told me to? Uh, man was not meant to be slaves to the devil. Uh, man was not meant to kill each other and to ravage this planet, to give in to our most base urges, amen, and inclinations to the point that the whole of society is depraved. Uh, homosexuality and lesbianism is considered normal in the segments of society today. Violence is a part of everyday life. Sickness and disease and war and strife are common occurrences. Fear and worry is the rule of the day. We live in a world gone mad. We live in a world of insanity. And the root of all of this madness and the root of all of this insanity is rebellion against God. The root of this debauchery is sin. Somebody say, help him, Holy Ghost. Now, if this were the only statement mentioned, we'd be in a sorry state indeed. But the writer of Hebrews goes on to state that into this situation, into this chaos, into this mess, into this filth, into this lasciviousness, into this debauchery came Jesus. Help me, Holy Ghost. Come on, talk back to me. See, it doesn't matter how bad your situation is if Jesus comes in. Talk to me, somebody, I'll talk better to you. Look at somebody and say, when Jesus comes in, blind eyes open up. When Jesus comes in, legs begin to function. When Jesus comes in, provision is multiplied. That which is dead comes back to life. Things which were lost get restored. Somebody say, I feel God in this place. The writer of Hebrews stated that into this sorry condition, amen, that humanity had digressed into, Jesus came and that he suffered and that he died and that because he suffered and because he died, he entered into glory. And he said that Jesus' suffering and Jesus' death and his glory were all for the benefit of mankind. Because listen now, Jesus died to make man better into what man ought to be back into what God intended us to be when God created us Jesus died in order to restore our image to restore our dominion to restore our blessings to restore every single thing that the devil tricked us out of or stole from us he died came and he died to rid mankind of our frustration and of our servitude and of our weakness and our inabilities and to give us back the dominion that help me Holy Ghost we were originally supposed to have somebody shout glory right there I'll get us there. Give me a little bit more volume. I'll be all right. Look at somebody and say, Jesus died to recreate man until man becomes the creature that man was originally created to be. Look at somebody and say, God did not create you. He did not cause your grandfather to meet your grandmother, give birth to your parents, cause them to meet, come together in intimacy, cause the one seed out of millions of other competing seeds to be the first to reach your mother's egg to fertilize it to progress through pregnancy to labor and delivery and develop a genetic identity that's unique in this world he did not cause you to not be miscarried aborted defected or stillborn in order for you to grow up accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and then live your life as a sick broke weak frustrated fearful defeated slave to the devil. Touch somebody and say, no, 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 no. He's got a plan for your life. He's got a call on your life. And he's already provided the means for you to fulfill your call and accomplish his plan. And it's through the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Through his atoning work, the Bible says that Jesus, through death, destroyed him who had the power of death, the devil. See, the devil held the power of death over man because of sin. When verse 14 says that the devil is destroyed, it doesn't mean that he's dead because the devil is very much still alive. But it means that his power is broken. The devil's power is death because the wages of sin is death. But with sin removed, which it was at the cross, 
the devil's claim over man is lost, which means that the power of death has been broken. Can I go a little bit deeper? See, you have to understand, saints, that the only way to destroy Satan was to rob him of his weapon, which was death. Jesus came to take the power of death away from the enemy. If you have a more powerful weapon than your enemy, then your enemy's weapon becomes useless. You can't fight against a machine gun with a bow and arrow. The devil had a powerful weapon, death. But no, don't get fooled now. Death is an extremely powerful weapon. But God has a weapon which is even more powerful, which is eternal life. And with it, Jesus destroyed death. Talk back to me, somebody. The way to eternal life is through resurrection. But the way to resurrection was through death. So Jesus had to experience death before he could be resurrected and thereby give us life. So then Jesus is dying, destroy death. I'll make it plainer. You've got to understand he went into death through death. But he came out on the other side, thereby conquering it. See, billions had went into death, but never came out of death. That's what was the source of death's power. The fact that it was a prison from which nobody could escape. However, when Jesus came back from the dead, he broke the power of death. The, the power of a prison is the locks on the cells, but when the locks are broken, the power of death lies in the fact that it was a prison cell with an unbreakable lock. But when Jesus broke free, he broke the power that empowered death. Then he could say in John 14 that because I live, you shall live also. How many of you know the resurrection of Jesus Christ provides the believer with eternal life? He died our death so that we might share his life. Death is the power of the devil's domain. And when Jesus shattered the devil's power, he also shattered his dominion. So Hebrews 2 and 15 says that Jesus delivered those who through fear of death were subject to bondage. See, I know one thing, saints. The one thing that terrifies people more than anything else is death. The scripture says that death and judgment are terrible for the sinner. But when we receive Jesus Christ, death holds no more fear if you're saved. If you save, you've been released from bondage to the fear of death. And instead, if we're saved, oh, we can say like Paul said, for me to live is Christ, but for me to die is gain. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? If you're saved, death no longer holds any fear because all death does is release us into the presence of the Lord. If you're saved, death is your servant. If you're saved, death is a divine chaperone. If you're saved, death is an escort service that ushers us into the presence of the Lord. If you are saved, you have no reason to fear death because you've placed your hands into the hands of death's conqueror and he will lead you into one side of the grave and lead you out of the other side. Tell somebody say all the grave is is a doorway. It's a divine egress. All death is is a turnstile that provides access from the natural realm into the spirit realm. It's a gateway that leads you from earth to heaven. It's a divine changing room where corruption puts on incorruption, where mortality puts on immortality, and you pass through its portals in order to meet the almighty God. Somebody say that's the point of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus has delivered us from the fear of death. Somebody shout glory right there. You have to understand, saints, that there is no need to fear death because if we are saved, we never have to die. 
Somebody say, wait a minute now, what is it? You get this? When you come to that great moment of passing from this life to the next life, somebody say, bless his holy name. We, 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 we never have to taste or experience death. If we believe, if we really trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he will deliver us from death. There is no death and no condemnation for the believer. Nothing to fear if you really believe God, if you trust him, amen. Uh, talk back to me right there. I'll make it plain a little later. Now, Hebrews chapter 2 then gives us three basic ideas. First, it says God created man only a little less than himself to enjoy dominion over all things. Then it says that man through his sin entered into frustration and defeat instead of mastery and dominion. Into this state of frustration and defeat came Jesus in order that by his life, death, and glory he might make man into what we were meant to be. The writer of Hebrews shows us the ideal of what man should be and then he shows us the actual state of man then he shows us how Christ the actual through him can be changed into the ideal now it's a simple but powerful fact on this resurrection Sunday Jesus died our death so that we might share his life it caused Jesus his life to make life available to us he experienced is death for every man in order to make life available for every man. But the writer of Hebrews goes still further. He expresses the fact that Jesus didn't come to redeem angels. He came to redeem man. So he took upon himself the form of a man in order to become like man in order to redeem man. So then the question was asked, saints of God, that if Jesus was and is God, then why was it necessary for him to become a man? And the answer is he became a man in order to substitute for man, in order to reconcile man to God, in order to qualify man for God's presence, and in order to destroy death. The Bible says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest power, Mike, that he might destroy the works of the devil. But here's your breakthrough right here. He not only come to destroy the works of the devil, that word destroy being from a Greek word which means to loose or untied or unbind. Beyond that, he also came to help those, uh, help me, Holy Ghost, that are or have been reconciled to God when they are tempted, tested, and tried. See, you've got to understand, I'm going to make it plainer. Jesus wanted to feel everything that we feel so that he could be, according to Hebrews, a merciful and a forgiving high priest. He came not only to save us, but to sympathize with us and to empathize with us as well. When Paul wrote to Timothy to give him pastoral counsel and to encourage him about his health and his critics and his welfare, Paul told him in the face of all of his opposition, he said, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. And what Paul was saying was that no matter where you may go or no matter what you may go to, Jesus has always already been there. Jesus came to identify with us. If he had come into this world in a form in which we could never, he couldn't have suffered. If he had came in a way where he couldn't have been tempted or tested or tried, he would have been very different from man. Consequently, he could not have been our savior. But it's his identification with us, which is the very essence of our relationship. I'm going to press my claim a little bit so we can go. Every other religion has as their idea uh, the, uh, the, the, idea, the idea of a detached God. The Muslims see Allah as a detached God who does not intervene in their affairs. Krishna is detached from the Hindus. Vishnu is detached from his worshipers. But the basis of our idea of God and the Christian's idea of God is relationship through identification. In other words, through his suffering, Jesus identified himself with man. So then this tells me, and I'm going to try to make it plain, then I'm going to get us out of here, that through his, this identification, Jesus Christ sympathizes with man. He literally feels for you. So what does this mean? It means you don't have to worry about whether people feel for you or not. As long as you understand the fact that if nobody else cares, if nobody 
else understands, if nobody else is concerned, Jesus cares. Jesus understands. Jesus is concerned. So I feel like preaching now. Somebody say, preach then, preacher. See, it's impossible to understand another person's sorrows, another person's suffering, unless you've been there. I never knew the anguish that a person felt over the loss of a loved one until my own mother died. Now every time somebody else loses a loved one, my heart hurts with their heart. I feel extra compassion because I know how I felt when I went through. Talk to me somebody. A person without a trace of nerves has no conception of the torture of nervousness. A person who is physically fit has no conception of the anguish of sickness. A person who's never experienced pain can relate to a person who's in pain. A person who's never been heartbroken cannot understand the pain of one who has. Before we can have sympathy, we have to go through the same things that the other person has gone through. And that's precisely what Jesus did. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He slept. He taught. He grew. He felt everything that we'll ever feel and more. He experienced temptation to a good degree we'll never experience. He knows where we hurt. He knows where we're weak. He knows where we're tempted. And I love the fact that I can not only cry out to him for salvation, I can cry out to him for sympathy as well. Touch somebody say there's comfort right there. Comfort in the fact that no matter what you're going through, you can be assured of the fact that you are not alone. I need some gain up here. I need some up. You can be assured of the fact that Jesus is right there with you in lion's dens and in fiery furnaces, in valleys of shadows, in front of red seas. And because he knows what you're going through, he understands how you feel. You can know beyond a shadow of doubt that he will make a way where there seems to be a way that cannot be made. The Bible says that Jesus became man's high priest. That's the reason he was made like us. That he might be a merciful high priest, a faithful high priest. He wanted to go through the trials and the tribulations that men go through to experience life like man experienced life in order to sympathize and feel for man and succor us when we face temptation. The word succor in the Greek means to help, to to relieve, to aid and arrest. It means to be so eager to help that you rush to the help of a person. Look at me, somebody, and talk back to me. Jesus Christ, he's heard your cry in all your sufferings, in all your pain, in all your trial, and he has run to help you and to deliver you. He said, I hasten myself to perform my word. Touch somebody and say, God is hastening to perform his word over your life. He made himself like you in order to feel with you and in order to deliver you. He does this in order to experience every situation, every condition, every circumstance or test or trial that you might go through. Don't you know that Jesus experienced the most humiliating experiences an individual could experience from the time he made his entrance into the world. He was born to an unwed mother. He was born in a stinking old barn. He was born to parents who were poor. He had his life threatened. Even when he was a baby, he had to escape and flee his country. His father died when he was young, and he had to support his mother and his sisters and his brothers. He didn't even have a place to lay his head. He was hated and opposed by the religious crowd. He was charged with being insane. Charged with being demon possessed. He was opposed by his own family. He was rejected. He was hated and opposed by his listeners. He was betrayed by a close friend. He was left alone. He was rejected. He was forsaken by all his other friends. He was tried before a high court. He was lied on by false witnesses. He was 
executed by crucifixion, the worst possible death. But the point is this, he went through the worst that you could go through, even to the point of death. But God brought him back. God raised him up. Oh, God loosed him from the pains of death and crowned him with glory and honor. Shout about it. That's how he can relate to what you're going through. Because he's been there and done that. And yes, it even killed him. But God brought him back from the death. And the same God that brought him back is the very same God that will bring you back as well. In his time of suffering, while he hung on a cross, Jesus watched the crowds that came to watch him. Some of them insulted him. Some spat in his face. Others called him names. Said he was not from God, said he was just a criminal, said he was just a sinner. Jesus said, my God, my God, in Aramaic, he said, for this I was kept. I was born for this. This was my destiny, to bear the sins of the world, and I'm up to the task. I can handle this assignment, because I know that there is a blessing waiting for me on the other side of this pain. There's a blessing in store for me on the other side of this trial. There's a blessing for me on the other side of this test. Talk back to me somebody. I can say this much as a personal testimony. There have been times in my life and in the life of my family when we've been through some fire that would have burned anybody else up. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? How many of you have been through some stuff that was so horrible that you couldn't tell anybody about it? You couldn't even let your feelings out. You couldn't share them with another. You had to suffer in silence. You had to internalize your pain. But in spite of all the tribulations that I have been through, the Lord has kept me. When I thought I was hurting all by myself, he was right there with me. When my wife thought she was crying alone, he was standing by her side. When my daughter thought she couldn't go on, he was holding her by the hand. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? When you're going through the worst hell of your life, and not only do people not care, not only do they not help, but they talk about you behind your back. They gossip about you. They judge you, they criticize you, they lie on you, they seek to accuse you, and they're secretly glad that you're going to. They're hoping you go under. They're waiting on you to fall apart, hoping you get a divorce, glad that you're having financial problems, happy you lost your job. Am I talking to anybody? Does anybody know people like that? Job's friends, they know you're going through, and they don't really care. They're just trying to find out what you did to get in the mess you're in. But how many of you know that there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother? How many of you are now glad that nobody walked with you when you were in the valley of your shadows? Nobody was with you in the valley of depression, in the valley of fear, in the valley of lack of sickness, but God, shout about it right there. Aren't you glad that since God brought you out, you don't owe anybody anything? You can enjoy your blessings without giving anybody else credit for it. And let me tell you one more thing. I'm talking to everybody under the sound of my voice. I've got a prophetic resurrection word for everybody that receives it. If you're going through an attack from the enemy, thus saith the Lord, don't you worry about a thing because Jesus is right there with you. He knows your struggle, he knows your issue, he knows your need, he knows what to do, he knows how much money you need, he knows you need a location, but God told me to tell you, he will take you through and he will bring you out. God told me to tell you, he's got a blessing on the other side of this struggle. He's got a blessing for you on the other side of this issue. There's a blessing on the other side of the drama. There's a blessing on the other side of the test. And he also told me to tell you that your latter end shall be greater than your former. 
God said he's bringing you out with silver and gold. He's bringing you out with the joy of the Lord. He's bringing you out with the desires of your heart. He's going to take you in to your personal promised land. Shout about it. Shout about it. Shout about it. God told me to tell you he's not only a God of sympathy, he's a God of reparations. The Bible says he stores up your tears. He said he's going to make sure you're compensated. For every tear you've cried, for all the pain you felt, for all the sorrow you've endured, somebody shout glory right there. For all, he's going to compensate you for every stressful day and every restless night. And he said, you can get ready to really start praising now. Because your blessing, touch somebody and say, it's on the way. Shout about it. Because he sympathizes, he can help us. He's met your sorrows. He's faced your temptations. And because of that reason, he knows exactly and precisely what help you need. And he promises to provide it. He said he'd be with us always. He said he'd never leave us or forsake us. He said he'd bless our basket and our store. Make us the head and not the tail. He promised to heal you. He promised to deliver you. He promised to bless you. He promised to make your way prosperous because he went through. He will help us when we go through. How many of you believe God this morning? Is there anybody here that believes the Lord? And you know by faith that not only has God brought you out, but he has a blessing in store for you. Stand up on your feet, clap your hands, open your mouth, and give him all the praise you can. Clap your hands, open up your mouth, and magnify the Lord. Magnify him, glorify him, exalt him, esteem him high, lift him up. Lift him up, lift him up. Lift him up, lift him up, lift up the name of Jesus. Somebody you'll see go to three people, tell them, say, God's going to bless you when he brings you out. Say, there's a blessing on the other side. There's a blessing on the other side of this cross. There's a blessing on the other side of this death. There's a blessing on the other side of this struggle. There's a blessing on the other side of this issue. There's a blessing on the other side of this drama. You're not going to for nothing. God has a blessing for you. He has a blessing for you. On the other side, the Bible says Jesus for the joy that was set before him, for what he knew lay up ahead, endured the cross, despising the shame, and now he sat down at the right hand of the Father. He knew what was waiting on him. God said, I've got a blessing waiting on you. I've got goodness waiting on you. I've got increase waiting on you. On the other side, Touch somebody and say, you can take it. You can make it. Whatever you're going through, you can take it. God built you to take it. He equipped you with everything that you need to come out. He's got a blessing waiting for you. On the other side. Clap your hands, open up your mouth, and give him all the praise you can. Lift your hands and let me bless you. Father, in the tremendous, magnificent, outstanding name of Jesus, whose we are and whom we serve, Lord, we thank you on this Resurrection Sunday for the light, for the illumination, for the inspiration that accompanies, for the encouragement that accompanies the reception of your word. Now, I pray for each and every one of these blessed saints, 
under the sound of my voice. All those who had in their heart and determined in their spirit that they would attend service on this resurrection morning to worship you, to praise you, to magnify you, to glorify you, and to hear from you. I pray, oh Lord, that you investigate and examine every area of their life in any area that needs an adjustment, Lord. Make a divine adjustment. Any area, oh Lord, that needs a touch from you, God, touch it. Father, some of your people are hurting this morning. They're suffering in silence. By external appearances, they seem to be all right, but internally, oh Lord, they're not all right. I pray that you touch their hearts, that you touch their spirits, that you encourage them and you exhort them you edify them and you comfort them in the fact that the good work you have begun in them you shall be faithful to perform until the day of Jesus Christ. I pray that you meet every need that they have. I pray that you bless them with the money that they need to live life more abundantly. I pray that those that are lonely be blessed with good relationships, oh Lord. I pray that those who are nervous be given a spirit of peace, oh Lord. I pray that those who are worried and frustrated, oh Lord, that you calm their situations, that you still their storms. I pray that you open up heaven's windows over the lives of these great people and pour them out blessings they don't have room enough to receive. I pray that you allow the vision that they have and their goals to be reached and that their vision to manifest. I pray, oh Lord, that you elevate their level of living that you bless them with careers and with opportunities and with positions, oh Lord, that will satisfy them. And I pray that you bring them out of their issues and their struggle and their drama and their tests and their trials and that you bless them when you bring them out, exceeding and abundantly above all that they can ask or think. And we give you glory, honor, and praise on this Resurrection Sunday, thanking you for the fact that because you raised from the dead, you can raise us from each and every one of our individual circumstances and situations. And we bless you, O oh Lord. We give you glory, honor, and praise. We declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is God come in the flesh. And we anxiously look forward to your return. In Jesus' name, clap your hands, open your mouth, and give him all the praise we can give him right now. Okay, saints of God, I pray that you are blessed in, by, and through that word. I pray that you learn something you had never known before and that it enhances your understanding of just what was accomplished on the cross of Calvary on the behalf of mankind individually and collectively through the substitutionary sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, because of what he did, amen, we are able to come into right relationship with God and it gives us hope and optimism rather than hopelessness and pessimism for, amen, our outcome. We know, amen, because we have a relationship with the Lord, we can count and depend upon him to cause all things to work together for good, amen, on behalf of those that love him, amen. So once again, I pray that you are blessed. Um, and listen, it's, it's, it's just good. You know, it, Resurrection Sunday, this, this time of, of year, it has a very, very different connotation for those of us who are saved. You know, when I was a child, you know, the family would go to church uh, once a year on Easter. And, uh, you know, there are those now that they tell themselves I'm going to go, but there's a different significance to it if you are in right relationship with the Lord. So I want to invite any of you out there that may be viewing this and you are not in right relationship with the Lord to give your life to Jesus Christ. Amen. Give your life to the Lord and watch what he does on your behalf. Amen? Amen. Listen, let's take our time right now, us believers, and bless the Lord in a different way through the giving of our material gifts. We're going to pay our tithe. We're going to give the Lord our very best offering. This is Holy Week. This is our Holy Week. This is the week when we um, pay special attention to what the Lord has done for us. Amen? There's a special reverence, a special significance. There's a consecration and sanctification that accompanies this week, Passion Week. Amen. The holiest week on the Christian calendar. And we want to give our offering to the Lord. The Bible says the tithe is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Amen. So I want you to go to givelify.com, text to give, tithely, PayPal, whatever platform you want to utilize. And we're going to honor the Lord with our substance, 
the first fruit of all I increase. Do you know that when you pay your tithe, you're testifying, you're signifying, you're symbolizing, you're adding your agreement and your faith to the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Why do I say that? Because Paul said in the seventh chapter of the book of Hebrews, he says, here men did die. And what he was saying, here mortal men, here, here men receive the tithe here on earth within the body of Christ, in the parameters and the dynamic known of his church, men receive the tithe. But there, in the spirit realm, in heaven, he receives them, who God receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. In other words, when we pay our tithe, we're saying we're tithing to a living God. Jesus Christ, he's not a dead God. The God that conquered death, hell, and the grave on our behalf. Our tithe says, I believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead. My offering says, I believe Jesus Christ is alive and alive forevermore. That the, the, the cross couldn't hold him, the grave couldn't hold him, that he's alive, that he ascended into heaven. You know, it's, it's more to it than just you just give it. And I get, I get, get some of my guy, my money because the church, uh -uh, it's not that at all. There's a spiritual significance to it, a spiritual component to it, that if you pay your tithe and give your offering, regarding and having reverence for the significance of it. And let me tell you something. Oftentimes our harvest is withheld. The multiplication that we believe should be upon this seed that we sow. It, it's, it's not, amen, uh, the increase isn't coming simply because of the attitude that we're sowing in. But if we sow in the attitude of reverence and humility and worship, we're worshiping the Lord through our giving. We're honoring the Lord with our substance. Amen. When we come to him with that attitude and our giving, that's when heaven's windows open up. Amen. And blessings are poured out that we don't have room enough to receive. So we want to do that. I want to encourage you to sow a special $33 seed on tonight. Jesus was in the grave three days and three nights. Three is the number of resurrection, restoration, and recovery. There's spiritual significance to everything that we do on behalf of the Lord. I want you to sow that $33 seed again on tonight as well. Over, the top, over top, over and above when you are going to give. Amen? Amen. Listen, we will be right here online tomorrow night for our Good Friday service. We will be right here online 7.30 p.m. We're going to be right here online live. Dr. Blender and I will be live online on tomorrow evening 7.30 sharp for our Good Friday service. Amen. We're going to talk about a few things. We're going to discuss some things. Amen. We, uh, it's going to be a great time in the Lord. We're going to interact with you live. So we want all of you to be right here with us online, right here at 7.30 p.m. on tomorrow. And then on Sunday, we'll be together, 3130 Mayfield Road, Cleveland Heights, Ohio, for our Resurrection Sunday service. I'm looking forward to seeing your face in the place. Service starts at 10.15 a.m. sharp. I want you to be there. So we can set an attitude, break up any fallow ground, and set an attitude of praise and worship that is conducive for the word of God to go forth in power and under the anointing. Amen? Amen. So I, so much as in me is, once again, I pray this is, that this message blessed you on tonight and increased your understanding of the dynamics of Jesus Christ's resurrection. I pray that you go to givelify.com, sow that seed, I pray that you sow over and above, in addition to what you were originally going to do, a special consecrated resurrection seed of $33. Then we'll be with you right here tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. At 7.30 p.m., we'll be right here online. And then Sunday, I want to invite everybody, everybody, out on Sunday, 10, 15 a.m. to New Spirit Revival Center, 3130 Mayfield Road. If there are those of you that you are in need of a church home, come out, audition us, <laughs> amen. Let the Lord use you, let the Lord lead you, amen, in your decision-making process. But if you've been telling yourself, I need to find a church home, or I'm considering a new church home, and you're waiting on a word from the Lord, well, I believe he unctioned me to give that word to you on tonight. Come out, visit with us, see what the Lord says. I want all of my members, I want you to invite a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, a relative, invite somebody to come to church with you on Resurrection Sunday. I mean, it should be easy to get somebody to come to church with you on Sunday, but don't just get in your car and come as you own. Invite somebody, bring somebody to church with you on this week. I guarantee we will not disappoint them or you. All right? 
till, well, I see you on tomorrow night. So until tomorrow night, the blessing of the Lord be upon you for the rest of this day and all of tomorrow, a blessing in the name of the Lord. Then I pronounce another blessing on you tomorrow night to take you from Friday to Sunday. All right? All right. God bless you.